This is part 8 in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to repair and restore this HP 9862A plotter. In the videos so far in this series I've been through some repairs to uh, the hardware, replaced a few missing parts and then I went through the uh, electronics. I didn't really show much of that, so I just found a few faulty ICs and um, that was really just a case of um, going through the electronics and uh, finding any uh, parts of the sequence that uh, the machine tries to generate that weren't working. Now to make that easier I was using a, a manual control that I demonstrated in the previous video where I just had a couple of switches attached to the port and then I could um, toggle the uh, control lines manually and send single specific commands to the plotter. And uh, in this uh, video what I want to show is the uh, way to control this using a small demo board like this. This is just a PIC microcontroller. I've just got a few of the control lines hooked up. Uh, the observant of you will notice that I only have a few of the data lines hooked up. So I've only got three data lines. Uh, and that's because the test program I'm running uh, doesn't require all uh, eight data bits. I'm just using the high order bits to move the pen. Uh, so all I'm going to do is um, start the plotter and then the PIC controller is powered from the plotter port. It just has some very simple code to just effectively draw a square on the plotter. Um, before we power this up, we'll just have a quick look at the code that's running in the PIC. I've been asked to show a bit more detail uh, when I use these. So firstly, this board, these uh, are available on my website as bare boards. And um, they're very simple, but uh, quite flexible. And this is the schematic for it. And so as you can see, it's very simple and just allows uh, any kind of configuration that you want. And then you just write the specific code that you require. And uh, I just have this hooked up so that uh, port B is used, that's the port B on the PIC, is used for uh, the data port and then port D is just used uh, for bit bashing the uh, control lines. And um, the LEDs are just used for status indication. And that's all I've used in this uh, particular configuration. I'm not even fitting a crystal to this board, it's using the internal oscillator in the PIC. So it's running at about 8 megahertz with a phase lock loop. And that gives me plenty of speed for this sort of application. It doesn't need to be very fast. And so we'll go over to the PC, have a look at the code that's running on this, and then we'll power it up and see what it actually does. So we're looking here at the development system I use for this particular project. I use uh, a variety of different uh, IDEs for developing different uh, microcontrollers. And I have two different ones I use for PIC microcontrollers. I have the, uh, the old MP lab, uh, which is useful for old legacy devices like this one. And on this board, I'm using a, a PIC 18F4455. Uh, I use that one because it's quite flexible and is also a five volt device, which most of the newer PICs aren't. And that's an important uh, point if you're going to try and hook a PIC to a, a piece of uh, vintage equipment, just bear in mind most newer PICs uh, are not 5 volt tolerant. Um, I also use uh, MP Lab X for the newer devices and I interchangeably use assembly language or a C compiler depending on what I'm doing. Uh, the assembly is very good for very low level control of uh, devices if you need performance, speed and flexibility. Um, but something like this project, um, C uh, is quite adequate, so that's what I've written this particular project in. So going through the project from the top, there are a few extra files that I won't show, they're just um, some housekeeping functions such as delays, that sort of thing, and uh, they are fairly uh, standard and uh, you can write your own or probably find some uh, that you can use uh, online. Having said that, if you are uh, starting out in developing with PIC microcontrollers, I strongly advise that you write your own libraries and don't rely on third parties. Okay, so what we have here is um, the configuration for the device. You can either configure the device um, in code like this, 
or in the IDE. I always prefer to do it in code. It makes it more transportable. Uh, and then I just have the includes for any of the external files that I want to uh, include in this project. So we have the header file for this project that's specific to this project. That just contains various um, bits of information that, uh, I'll just open that up, uh, allow me to configure this particular device and a few defines, very straightforward. There's nothing much in this particular uh, project, just a couple of functions, uh, but even these you could get away without using if you wanted to. Uh, we then have the general uh, include file for this particular device. That's one that's provided by uh, microchip, although I have modified the one uh, that I use, uh, simply because I like to uh, have what amounts to a pseudo uh, compiler language rather than relying on uh, cryptic um, names for certain registers. So this is just really a breakdown of all the uh, individual um, registers and uh, features and functions within the device. But you can add to this if you want to, but I normally add uh, through adding additional uh, files. Uh, we then have the delays uh, header file. That's just a few functions for variable uh, delay lengths and then hardware. And the hardware, uh, again, it's specific to this project uh, or at least this board. And uh, this is a fairly standard uh, header file I use when I'm using this particular um, demo board. And it allows me to give sensible names to each of the bits, whether it be a port bit or a latch bit. Uh, main difference is if you are writing out to the port, uh, you want to write to the latch. So this is what we're doing here, where it's, uh, this for example, is port B uh, out zero. So that's bit naught of port B. And if we want to write to it, we write to the latch. Um, but if we're reading from that port, then in general, you want to uh, read from the port, not from the latch. You can it will compile if you do it the other way around but you might find that the uh, behavior is not quite as you would expect it to be because the latch and the port are not always the same and especially if you're using uh, read modify write instructions uh, then that can cause you a major headache because you won't be writing to the port uh, what you might expect okay so once we have the um, all the includes added to the file. The next thing to do is to create any specific defines for this project. So in this particular project, I'm referring to the data bus as data bus out, and you could just use port B out or, or even the um, port B itself. Uh, but doing it this way means that in the code, it's, it makes the code more readable. Um, we're using the flag. Now these are the names as specified by uh, HP in the plotter uh, manuals. So I'm sticking to the same names just to make it easier for me to remember which is which. Again, you could just use um, the defines in the header file or even the defines in the pick header file. But again, doing it this way makes the code more readable. Just a couple of variables in this uh, project. We have uh, an unsigned character for the index. That's just the index into this array. And the array just contains the, um, the data values we intend to send to the plotter. So the way that the interface to the plotter works is each transfer of data is actually four bytes and they're sent in four separate phases, so four cycles. And that is important as far as the plotter is concerned. If you get out of step with the plotter, it will throw up an error. The only exception to this is if you're trying to do a pen up or pen down command, it's a single byte. So even though it uses the same initial mechanism for the first byte of a multi-byte transfer, uh, you abort that sequence after the first byte is sent. Uh, but you do need to have the control lines in the appropriate states. Uh, otherwise, again, the plotter will throw up an error. So these values I've chosen are just to draw a square on the plotter and then return to the home position. And it, it might look a bit uh, odd uh, in terms of um, the values I've selected. Bear in mind that each of the um, 
x and y values you send is actually a, a two byte value, so it's a 16 bit value, but it's in BCD format. So um, essentially each of the two bytes you send are separate numbers. It's not, uh, it's not like binary where you combine the numbers in, into a single 16 bit value. Each eight bit value is a separate digit. So for example, um, the first eight bits are one digit between zero and nine and the next one are a second digit between a value of zero and nine. You don't combine them into a 16 bit value. So the first two values are the 16 bit BCD representation of the X coordinates. And the second two values are the BCD value for the Y coordinates. And then you just repeat that. Uh, also note that they are inverted. So the plotter uses um, inverse logic and um, that's one thing to bear in mind if you're reading through the HP manual. It doesn't make it particularly clear that sometimes it's referring to signal levels, and other times it's referring to logic levels, even though the logic levels themselves are inverted. So in other words, it might show a one. But what it actually means is a zero. OK, so that's just setting the uh, values we want to send. We then start the main codes. If you're not familiar with the way this uh, is arranged, it's very similar to a standard C uh, program. So we have a main function. So it starts here and ends here. Uh, we have a port initialization function. So this is just setting the uh, various ports in out whatever we want to define for this particular project. Uh, we then set the control lines that we've defined for our start uh, values. So this is the initial uh, control lines going to the uh, plotter. We set the index into the data array to zero. So we're starting with the first byte. And then we've got a one and a half second delay here. Bear in mind, this might be the first pass through the loop and uh, we need to allow the plotter time to start up. We then go into our main uh, function. So this is where we'll repeat indefinitely. This the way I've got this set up. It'll just keep going round and round until we turn the thing off. And so we then want to make sure the pen is up. So we send or we set the control lines for the pen up uh, command and then we send one uh, byte. So we're not really sending any data as such. Um, but what we're doing is we're toggling the control line to the plotter is okay so that function is down here so we start by waiting for the plotter to indicate that it's ready we then set the uh, control line to true which in this case is setting it to a zero we allow time for the pen to lower we then wait for the uh, plotter to respond we clear the control line allow time for this command to complete and then we return. So that will cause the pen to um, be raised if it was down. The next thing, and this is only done when the index is at zero. So we do this at the beginning of the main loop when the index is zero. The next part here is uh, only um, active when the index is eight. So we'll come back to that uh, later on. So the next thing we do, we've raised the pen. And as I said, the data transfer is to send four bytes of data. So we set the control lines ready for a move instruction. We send the first byte of data and that function is down here. So all it does, very similar to sending a command, except that there are no delays and we set the data bus to the next value in the array, and then we increment the index in the array. Okay, so we send the next byte. After we've sent the first byte, we need to set the sync line to a one, just to make sure that we stay synchronized with the plotter, otherwise it will throw an error. And then we send the remaining three bytes by reading them from the uh, array incrementally. When we get to the end, we check to see if we're at the end of the array. If not, we go back to the start of the loop. Obviously the index is no longer zero. 
If it's got to a value of eight, uh, then we lower the pen. So this is just lowering the pen when the uh, pen's in a particular position in our drawing. And then it carries on, sends the next data bytes, and that causes the plotter to move the plot ahead from the previous location to the next one. We check to see if we're at the limit again, and we just keep going round, causing the plotter to move from one point to the next until we get to the end of the array. We then set the index back to zero and we start the entire process again. But because when we set the index back to zero, we encounter this point again and it causes the pen to be raised again. So very simple code. That's all that's in here really. And we'll now go and look at the machine and see this code in action and uh, how it uh, exercises the plotter. So I have that code programmed into the PIC. I've got the PIC connected up with just the three data lines that we need uh, and the control lines. And what I'll do now is power up the plotter. Um, we'll see the um, PIC come to life. The LEDs indicate various um, values, including the flag value. So the second LED from the right is the control line. And you'll see that very briefly flash. In fact, you might not see this it. very brief. It's only on until the plotter responds and it goes out. Um, the center LED is the flag line from the plotter. So that's on when the plotter is busy. So you'll see that coming on while the plot is busy doing something. And then it'll go off to indicate to the pick that the plot is ready for the, uh, the plotter is ready for the next command or data. Okay, so I'll power it up, and this should start the plotter going through um, the test program that we've written. So as you can see, that's working. Now it's going very slow because I've got a one and a half second delay between each of the moves. So what I'll do now is I'll swap the pick out for uh, the exact same code, but with the delays removed and you'll see the um, plotter then running at its normal speed. Okay, so that's same code, but without the delays, we'll power the plotter back up. And you can hear the pen lowering and raising at the correct points. So hopefully you can see the pen raising and lowering as well. So that's it, it's, you can write whatever code you want, you can make it as complex as you want, and it depends really what fault finding you're trying to do. And it's a very powerful way of testing a machine like this, and it's far more convenient than trying to use an actual uh, calculator or uh, any other uh, means of testing uh, something like this, because you can just keep repeating the same command, and if you're experiencing a problem uh, while a certain function is being performed, uh, then it's extremely easy just to write some simple code to uh, exercise the plotter. And um, it makes it very uh, straightforward uh, if you're hunting down particular faults. So that's the kind of uh, approach I was using when I was tracking down the faults. And uh, somebody in the comments to the previous video asked uh, what soldering iron I used. And another comment was, um, how do I replace uh, ICs on the, these boards? So uh, before I finish this video, I thought I'd just give a very quick demonstration as to uh, how I uh, replace um, ICs on these vintage boards. Okay, so this is a board I'm working on for another machine. This is not part of the plotter, um, but I thought I'd use this because this particular type of board is actually very difficult to work on. It's got quite small holes and it's double-sided and uh, it can be quite difficult uh, getting these devices out so I thought it would be a good 
uh, example as to the method I use. I need to replace this device, it's uh, faulty, and um, there are various ways I go about doing this depending on uh, the type of board, the material, and uh, the way that you go about it uh, is obviously entirely up to you, depends on the equipment you have, but as I said I've been asked to show this so I thought I might as well show it in this video. Um, the other thing to bear in mind when I'm doing this is what my purpose is, whether I'm trying to repair the board or if I'm trying to get the device out to reuse it, and obviously it's a very different approach that I take for that. Uh, in fact, having said that, I generally do try to get devices out, even if I suspect they're faulty, without damaging them. I know some people say, you know, cut the leads off and then take the leads out uh, one at a time. I tend not to do that simply because I want to be able to test the device once I've removed it without fear of me having destroyed it. Uh, I see this sort of work as a continuous learning curve and I learn something new with every single machine I repair and uh, that includes um, uh, modes of failure. So while it's, uh, you know, learning about electronics is important for repairing electronic devices, um, seeing different modes of failure is also very useful. When you learn about electronics, you tend to learn about devices on the assumption that they are working, um, but they can behave very differently as they start to fail, and that's something that uh, can always throw up surprises. So. I always find it interesting to try and examine devices that I believe have failed uh, just to see firstly if it has failed because if it hasn't the fault somewhere else uh, but also what the mode of failure is and it can be very uh, informative to do that. Um, this board as I say is quite difficult to work on because it has very small pads that are easy to lift. Um, it's fairly old so the solder's uh, well and truly dried up and um, it can represent quite a challenge getting these components off without damaging the board. Um, but if you do it right you can replace components without uh, the, there being any real sign of you having been here and um, it, sometimes damage occurs but uh, it should be fairly rare. So the tools I generally use, um, I do have things like this but I hardly ever use these. I might use them in old vintage radials with as big um, solder tanks and terminals but I tend not to use these. I do have tools such as this which is a solder sucker um, with a heated tip. Again I tend not to use this that much it's fairly hard on the boards it can damage the pads so I don't use it that much. The method I normally use is to use something like this so a desolder braid and the soldering iron. For this to work very well, uh, you do need quite a good iron. Um, you, you try using this and you've got a poor iron that doesn't have a good thermal uh, mass to its tip, uh, then you'll find it very difficult to use this and it'll look like it just doesn't work. Uh, so you do need a particularly good iron. And the, the better your iron, the less chance uh, you'll damage the board that you're working on. So the type of irons that uh, I use something like this. I think I've shown this before. Uh, I've got a few of these. I've got uh, ones, I've got the larger version like this and I've also got the precision version which is like this. So if it's a uh, small um, components I'll tend to use this. I don't use this much for desoldering but if it's a very small surface mount this is uh, very useful. Um, but in general for the larger and vintage equipment I will use this one so this is the 120 watt version and in particular I will start off with a very large uh, tip that has a large thermal mass. So I'll get this plugged in and we'll start removing the device from the board. Okay now I had hoped to show this under the microscope but unfortunately my microscope has got a very narrow field of view and a very uh, shallow focal length so it wasn't really working uh, that well. So um, I'll have to do it under the camera. I'll zoom the camera in a bit so you can see a bit more clearly what I'm doing but um, not quite sure how clearly this will come across but hopefully you'll get the general idea as to the approach that I take. Okay well hopefully you can see this. Um, so this is the device I want to take out. I've uh, got the iron heat it up. Don't have it too hot, it doesn't need to be horrendously hot. If you get it too hot you'll just 
boil off all the remaining flux. You can try um, putting flux on this, but in general I tend to find it's not necessary. If it's a really old board, um, what I will often do is uh, re-solder or re-flow the joints first by effectively re-soldering them with fresh solder before I try and remove the old solder, but we'll see how this goes. I also normally do this under a microscope, but uh, we'll give this a go like this and see um, how far we can get. So all we do is on for each pin is heat it up, make sure it's good and hot and then rock the solder iron away from the joint and it should suck the solder away from the joint. And we do that for each of the joints, work our way along. I'll generally do two or three joints and then stop, let the device cool down and uh, repeat it. So it might seem a bit strange considering these are uh, faulty but um, I want to as I say remove it without uh, potentially damaging it further and uh, that allows me to check it when I've taken it out to see if it is actually faulty and what the mode of failure was. Okay so I work my way along suck, and I'll remove the solder from the rest of the pins on this side and then we'll take the next step depending on uh, how successful that's been. Okay, so that's all the pins initially uh, desoldered. So now I've been through all of the pins and removed the bulk of the solder, the chip still will not come out and um, it's important you don't try and just lever them out using more force. Firstly, there will be solder on the other side of the um, board, but also the pins tend to be kind of splayed out when they're pushed into the board. So the pins are really still stuck to the side of the holes with solder. So the next thing to do is to come in, this is why a, a wide uh, bit comes in handy, and without pushing on the pad itself, just push on the tip of the pin, heat it up, and when the pin gets hot, you'll be able to push it away as I did there, so you can see the pin is now not on the side of the hole, and just do that for all of the pins, so it's very gentle, doesn't require a lot of force, but make sure you're not pushing on the pad, only push on the tip of the pin. And then as the pin gets hot, as I say, it will just move away from the side of the hole. So just do that for all of the pins. And what we're trying to do here, of course, is just effectively straighten them out so that uh, the pins are not soldered to the side of the hole. Okay, so now all the pins are effectively centred in the holes, but they're still soldered to the board because we still have solder on the top side of the board. So what we have to do now, is trim the end of the braid, is we'll come along on the top and just gently remove the solder from the top edge where the pin meets the board. So there won't be a great deal, but just to remove it, we'll do that for all the pins. Uh, again, if I'm trying to uh, recover the chip without damaging it, I'll just do a few pins, let it cool down, and then uh, move on. So I'll do the rest of the pins and see how far we get. Okay, so once I've removed the solder from the top, I just come along and just gently push on each of the pins to make sure that it is free. I don't want to be pulling up on these pins if they're still soldered to the pad and if they do still seem to be attached then I don't try to remove the IC until they are all free. So what I'm doing is making sure that each of the pins move as I push on it, which it does. And you should find then that the IC is free to uh, move. Uh, if it does appear to be caught anywhere then don't proceed. You can see this one is free and it will just lift out and uh, in theory we haven't done any damage to the board and we haven't done any damage to the IC. So what we'll do now is clean up the board. So we've got all the flux residue, it doesn't look too bad but um, the next thing is to clean this up. So I find the easiest way to do this is a bit of IPA, a fairly stiff brush, not too stiff, you don't want to damage the, uh, the board. And then just 
put it on, give it a few seconds to uh, dissolve the flux. Doesn't take a lot of scrubbing, I'm just working it into the board. And then once it's loosened all the flux, just get a bit of uh, kitchen towel and you can then mop off all the flux. What you end up with is a board that looks pretty much new. You can't uh, really tell that uh, anything's been removed. Flip it over, do the same on the back. And mop off any flux. If there still appears to be dirt or flux on there, then just repeat. And just basically keep doing that until the board is clean. So again, on the back, you wouldn't be able to tell that, that anything has been removed. It looks like a new board. And uh, when you come to soldering the new device, again, just clean the flux off when you're finished and it will look like a, a brand new board. You won't be able to tell that it's actually been replaced other than uh, it will just actually look cleaner than the rest. But uh, the whole idea is to uh, not damage the board. Now these are particularly difficult boards to work on because the holes are so small and also they're quite old, but um, on boards such as those in the uh, calculator they're actually easier to work on because the holes are a lot bigger um, but uh, hopefully that helps uh, the only downside of this technique is the um, the solder braid is quite expensive it looks like a slow and tedious process but once you've done it a few times you'll be able to remove and replace a, an IC in probably three or four minutes it's, it's actually surprisingly quick you'll get some that are stubborn but uh, it's better to take your time and not do any damage uh, because it can easily take you a very long time to repair a board if you damage it. And just bear in mind uh, the tracks, the pads will lift if you get them too hot. So don't have the iron too hot and don't leave the iron on too long. If it's not uh, working, take the iron away, let it cool down and try again. If you can't get the solder to come out, apply fresh solder and then try again. And once you get enough flux, uh, flying around it should uh, uh, work and the solder braid should suck out the solder and then you just solder the new component in as you would with a new board okay well I hope that helps uh, anyone that's working on things like this if you've uh, got other methods and uh, uh, advice you want to offer people then please leave a comment so we can now fit the replacement component And as you can see, it's very difficult to tell that uh, we've actually tampered with this at all. And uh, once you've soldered it in, uh, I try to match the solder as well. I think I pointed out in a previous video that you can influence the way solder joints look in terms of uh, how shiny they are by varying the temperature of the soldering iron, depending on the type of solder you're using. So I always try to match it with the surrounding solder. Um, but once this is soldered in and you clean the flux off, it's going to be very difficult to uh, be able to tell that you've actually replaced anything. Okay, that's it for this video. In the next video, I'll be looking at repairing the platter, the paper support, and uh, refitting that to the machine, and we'll see how it looks.